Welcome to Invest in the Family Radio, a podcast about learning to invest. My name is Brian Bain, and I'm your host. At Invest in the Family Radio, we believe that you can become a great investor. How? By building the right plan and then sticking to it. According to Warren Buffett, that's really what it takes to set yourself apart from the crowd. And everything we do here is meant to help you get there. So thanks for joining us. And you can always find more at investinthefamily.com and subscribe to the podcast at iTunes, Stitcher, and the Google Play Store. And on today's show, we're going to be revisiting the up and down Wall Street column from Barron's Magazine this week. And this week, instead of um, Randall Forsyth writing the column, apparently Randall Forsyth is on vacation. So Copen Tan wrote this week's article. And I've always enjoyed Copen's work at, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, I'm really not sure, but it's K-O-P-I-N. And I've always enjoyed his work at Barron's, so I, w- I enjoyed him writing the um, the lead article for this week's um, uh, Mag- Barron's Magazine, and the title is A Wild Shopping Spree. We'll get into that in just a moment, but before we do that, I want to do a little bit of uh, um, house cleanup, I guess as you could say. First of all, I want to apologize, because this is the first podcast you've heard from me in about two weeks or so, maybe a little bit more. Basically, what happened was I had a long business trip that I went on. Um, where I wasn't doing any podcasting, and then we had Thanksgiving holidays, and as those things were coming up, I I'd been churning through content for months, putting out three or four podcasts a week, and uh, it, from what I can tell, and the feedback I've gotten from you, you've really been enjoying that, which is encouraging. And but what what that did was I was churning through content, creating a lot of stuff, and then releasing it in real time. When I finished it, I put it out to you. What that meant is when I came to go on vacation or on, excuse me, a work trip, the I didn't have anything in the the reservoir to uh, to send out to you while I was gone. So that meant there was a dry period, which honestly I'm fine with. I have no problem having a few weeks with no content because I think that's just healthy. That's life. We, we all need breaks. You probably need a break from me for a little while as well. But what I didn't do is communicate that. So for that's what I'm apologizing for. I should have sent out a podcast and an email letting you know um, that that was going to happen, but it kind of um, snuck up on me, to be honest, which uh, is not the way I like things to happen, but it did, it, did, it did this time. But thank you for all your concern. For those of you who sent me emails wondering where the podcasts were and if anything had changed, I assure you that I am still here and have no plans to end this podcast. Not Nothing to be concerned about. And actually, in contrast to that, there are changes coming with this podcast and with Invest in the Family that I'm very excited about. As I continue to, I continue to be unsatisfied with where things are in investing in the family. I am encouraged at the growth. I am encouraged at the progress that has been taking place. But the quality of this podcast and the quality of the product coming out of this business, while it, it, I think in many ways it is good, there is a lot of room for improvement. I want this to be a podcast and a business that is that every podcast, every email, every piece of content that I released will be seen as extremely high value to you and something you'll want to share with other people and something that you'll want to hear, rehear, implement yourself, and on and on. Because I, that, otherwise, what's the point of doing this? So I've got some things in mind I'm, I'm going to be rolling out in coming months. And uh, something else I'm going to kind of a carrot I'll dabble out there too is a partnership that I have with Seeking Alpha for an online event in January that I'm really excited about. And more info will be coming in coming weeks and months, but just wanted to kind of tip my hat to that idea and say thank you all for your patience, thank you for your understanding, and uh, my apologies for not communicating better the last few weeks. That being said, let's jump into this week's Up and Down Wall Street column from Barron's Magazine titled, "Wild A Wild Shopping Spree. That's not my title, that's theirs, and uh, my title is going to be different than that because I don't really like that title. So basically, the theme this week was looking at okay how, how last week that the S&P 500, the Dow Jones, the NASDAQ, and the Russell, all these indexes were at record highs as of last week, which is crazy because everyone figured if Trump won the presidency, the markets would tank. They still might. That could still happen, but it hasn't happened. Uh, the night, if you remember the night of the election, the, the at one point the futures for the S and P were down over 800 points, which is a big, big, big one day drop. But by the next, but by the time the next day ended, they were up over 300 points, I think, which is a pretty big one day gain. And haven't really looked back much. This, the markets have continued to climb and climb, and rallied significantly off the news of the Donald Trump victory of the presidency of the White House. And again, there are, as always, people see things differently, and some people see this as overdone. Some people see this as um, getting ahead of the game and delaying the inevitable 
pullback correction that will come as a result of Donald Trump being president. Some are still calling for recessions and even a dep- not maybe not a depression, but maybe well, actually I've seen some people say they think a depression could be coming because of what Donald Trump says he will be doing as president. But the reality is no one knows. So remember that whenever you hear me or anyone else make predictions about the future, put a big asterisk next to it because no one knows. And Many brilliant people have been proven wrong with their predictions of the future. So one of my general caveats is the more certain someone is in their future uh, prediction, probably the greater likelihood is that maybe they're wrong, (laughs) at least on some degree. Um, Of course, that can be wrong as well. So there's that. So that was a big theme for this week's article is the record highs of all four major indexes, which is something no one expected. And um, Bank of America Merrill Lynch did a survey of, I believe it was 177 global fund managers. And here were some of the feedback they got. Um, so of the, the global fund managers who expected global the global real economy to strengthen over the next 12 months. First of all, let's pause. The global real economy. Here's one problem with economists and the financial industry. Why do we need so many terms? What is the global real economy? All these different terminologies. I'm not going to get into the specifics what these mean, but I think it's just it's unnecessary ways to make things unnecessarily complicated, in my opinion. But anyway, a global fund managers that expect the global real economy to strengthen over the next 12 months. In October, 19% of these global fund managers expected the global real economy to strengthen over the next 12 months. This month, after the election, that number jumped to 35%, okay? So in October, before the election, 19% thought the economy would strengthen over the next 12 months. After the election, 35%. That's almost a doubling of the people who um, are now optimistic over the economy for the next 12 months. Again, 35% is still a minority, but still significant. A significant number of people have had a a shift in perspective, which is um, of note. Also, global inflation expectations have vaulted to the highest level since 2004. And if you've been following my show or any financial news for any period of time, you'll know that inflation has been what central banks have been striving with all their being to make happen in Japan, in Europe, in the U.S., and elsewhere, trying to create inflation. And they haven't been able to do it. They've been struggling deeply to make that happen. A lot of them have have had targets of inflation at 2% and just could not do it despite um, uh, quantitative easing, despite low interest rates. But apparently, in light of the a, a number of things, the election being one of them, but not the only by any means, um, expectations for inflation have in, are now at the highest level since 2004. Note 2004 was three to four years before the financial crisis which that has brought a lot of this about. So that's significant news as well. And I've and I know a number of people that I read that are preparing for inflation to come. Part of that the mindset is if infrastructure spending that Donald Trump has proposed here in the US if that actually comes about that'll mean a lot more money into the hands or the pockets of companies that will then go into the pockets of subcontractors that will then go into the pockets of employees that will then be spent into the economy. So what that does is create what they call the velocity of money. So there's a lot more money moving in the economy. And so more people wanting to buy the same amount of goods means the price of those goods goes up, which is inflation. So when more money is chasing less product or equal product, that means the value of the money um, decreases in relation to the value of the product, if that makes sense. The value becomes more expensive. And so that way, the money appears to be less valuable. I hope that makes sense. So that's what they're seeing there, at least a big part of it. So the question is, is all this optimism um, a sign that the bull market will continue or that we've peaked? Uh, again, if you've listened to me for any period of time, you know that one of the big things I like to point to, and I'm not the only one, but one of the big uh, tells um, uh, or the, 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 the things that kind of tip us off to the fact that we could be at the end of a bull market is when euphoria um, or optimism starts reaching euphoric levels. And I don't, th- I don't feel the euphoria at this point, but the increased levels of optimism does lean me toward thinking that um, the bull market is maturing to uh, getting closer and closer to ending, as opposed to the fact that the bull market is continuing. Obviously, it is continuing right now, 
but I think that means we're getting that much closer to a peak, in my opinion. It could be wrong. Um, <laughs> see the beginning of the podcast um, as proof that I could be wrong. So our current, and another uh, point was brought up, is our current stock market gains stealing from 2017. So basically, are all the gains right now just based upon expectations of what will happen in 2017, which means... 2017 will have nothing really to offer or not as much to offer in terms of gains for the stock market because we're getting ahead of the game. Kind of like, think about a company like Amazon or Tesla that have really high stock prices in relation to their earnings. And the idea is that, well, the future growth of these companies um, is what you're buying right now, which, you know, okay, that's can be good or can be bad depending on how well that growth follows through and increases because you're basically buying future growth today. And the concern is right now the markets are showing future growth today and may leave us out the dry in the future, maybe as soon as 2017. Goldman Sachs strategist expect Trump tax reforms to lead to the repatriation of $200 billion. So basically that means you've heard it, um, that U.S. corporations have billions and billions and billions and billions of dollars stuck overseas because they want to. They don't want to bring it home or repatriate it because if they do so, they'll face significant tax consequences. But if the the tax reforms that President Elect Donald Trump has proposed happen, that could lead the repatri- to the repatriation of over two hundred billion dollars to the U.S. That money could be used to pay down um, uh, debt levels for many companies, which debt levels that have been rising as companies have taking loans and raised de- debt offerings because of low interest rates. They may want to start paying some of that off with the money they bring back to the U.S. And they also um, expect that non-financial companies or non-financial companies are sitting on $1.6 trillion in cash, trillion with a T, which represents basically 12, 12% of assets of these companies are in cash. And the long-time average is 7%. So there's a almost twice as much cash sitting in the books for non-financial companies um, compared to long-term averages, which, again, is, is money that could be spent, which is a good thing. Um, bad thing is when it's parked and not going into the economy, creating movement and um, stimulus into the, into the economy. Because people have not been spending money because they've been concerned about the future of the economy. If those concerns start to... Um, recede that could mean this money being spent and Goldman expects companies to spend 2.6 trillion dollars of cash in 2017 where the number comes from I have no idea I have no idea how Goldman tries to predict how what all US companies will spend in cash in 2017 how that number how they come to that number how they even know that number from 2015 and 17 I guess they can go through all financial statements and pull it together I kind of doubt that they're doing that so anyway, curious how they do that. And again, the asterisk of they're predicting the future, which means they're probably wrong. So they of that $2.6 trillion of cash they expect to be spent in 2017, Goldman says they expect 52% to be spent on capital expenditures, research and development, and mergers, um, and then 48% on buybacks and dividends. So the, that 52% is great for the economy. The 48%, not really, because buybacks don't help the economy. They help stock prices, but not the economy. And they don't say much in terms of the company's well-being either. Dividends can be good for investors, um, but don't necessarily speak to the the strength of the economy. Don't necessarily help the economy either. Um, not to the same degree that that 52% spent on capital expenditures, research and development, and mergers would. Um, another thing. That, another thing that's been happening is that small cap stocks. Um, that investors think could benefit from infrastructure spending. They've been stealing attention and seeing significant gains um, in contrast to multi- big multinational companies that could be impacted negatively by the strong dollar. So you've seen kind of investors shifting money from multinational companies to small cap stocks that could benefit from infrastructure spending. And the market is basically, basically the market is behaving like Trump will fulfill all the promises that they think are great and will break all the ones they don't like, which basically means they're being extremely optimistic. And anytime someone is being extremely optimistic about the future in this way, that is reason for caution and concern, in my opinion. Again, that doesn't mean exit the market. That doesn't mean doing anything extreme or crazy, but be on guard, be on watch. The AAII was at the Association of American... Investors Institute. Man, I had that magazine in front of me. Throw it away. I can't even remember what AAII stands for. Hold on, here we go. I got a card from someone from AAII. Let's see. It is the uh, let's see American Association of Individual Investors. Um, great organization. They they do this ongoing survey of bullishness of sentiment, bullishness, bearishness, neutral, and they showed that bullishness jumped from twenty three point seven percent 
to 50% in just three weeks. It's a big jump in bullishness, which is another sign that they're significantly increasing levels of optimism, which is reasons for caution, in my opinion. Another thing of note is that the, the, the demand for puts relevant to calls on the, the on SPY, the ETF that checks the S&P 500, shrank to levels we haven't seen since July 2016. It's not that long ago, but it, it does show that people are much more optimistic as on the markets um, as a result of the elections, which is a shift that we've seen in, in the last six months or so. The reality is it's too early for bulls or bears to draw any significant conclusions. Um, the bears who may be thinking, this is the end, things are, evaluations are extreme levels, and so on and so forth, should be reminded that the S&P 500 traded at 28 times earnings in 1999. So that was right before the tech bust, the big bubble bust of 2000. So at that point, the S&P was traded at 17, at 28 times earnings in 1999. But today, quote unquote, only is trading at 17 times earnings, which is still high, historically speaking, but not crazy. It's not extreme. So the S&P 500 levels are high, but not insane or a reason for extreme concern. So that being said, if there, if a correction did come or a big pullback, there's not as far to fall as there was back in 1999 and 2000. Um, the stock market capitalization, um, overall, the stock market capitalization in the U.S. is 200% of GDP, which is really high. So basically, the value of the stock market is twice that of the, the GDP in the U.S., which is kind of crazy. And interest rates are at record lows and rising fast. So basically, the idea is that the stock market is at significant, is really high levels compared to GDP. Interest rates are interest rates are really low, which is supposed to be good for the economy, but rising fast. So basically, how much better can things get? How much higher can the market climb? And rates can't really lower much to improve the economy. So what should we do with all that? And all that is reason for caution as well. Um, and then also another thing that was mentioned is concerns over what Trump will do with trade partnerships continues. What will he do with TTP? Well, he said it was what he's going to do with the, the Pacific Trans-Pacific Trade Partnership. I always forget the acronym. Was it TPP? Trans-Pacific Partnership, I believe it is, and NAFTA and NATO and all these different things. And, you know, he's talked about being um, against many of these, um, either completely or partially. So the concerns there is, that was mentioned in the article is that quote unquote protectionist policies, they could harm the US economy because um, anytime you inhibit trade, that has the potential for doing that. Um, even if it does bring jobs home, it could hurt the economy in other, in other ways. But there's also concern over retaliation from trade partners um, if these pacts are broken or altered in ways they deem unfair. They don't get into in details as far as what retaliation could mean. Um, I can only assume they mean on economic levels. But those are the concerns that were mentioned. And so basically, what's the takeaway from all of this, in my opinion? Well, I've already said it. I think it's continue to be cautious. Nothing's changed. Um, the, the, basically, all this uh, excitement and optimism from what Trump has said, you know, for a lot of sectors of the economy, they, they could be really optimistic. And I think it's, there's good reason to continue to be invested. There's good reason to continue to, um, uh, to be in the markets, to, to make good, um, good decisions about um, investments. So the, the beauty of value investing is you look to buy companies that are undervalued, that are the stock price is less than the book value of the company, so you can't really go wrong. Or it's hard to go wrong, I should say. You can always go wrong a little bit. Um, but there's still reason to be cautious. There's healthy reasons to have um, uh, healthy levels of cash or higher than normal levels of cash in your portfolio. Um, or at least that's my opinion. And so, but I don't see reason for extreme concern. Um, but you need to invest the way you think you should invest. And if, if, you, if you're concerned, then raise cash levels and get some hedges. Um, otherwise, stay tuned because it's really too early to tell. That's a wrap. That's the article for this week. Those are some of my thoughts on that. And again, I've been implementing my thoughts more throughout the article as opposed to saving them to the end. I think it works a little bit better that way. And again, exciting things come with the podcast. Thank you for everyone who's reached out over the last few weeks and asked about where the podcast is because you've missed it. That's awesome. I love that you've missed it. And I'm sorry I didn't communicate, but I love that you've missed it because that tells me that it's valuable and you enjoy it as do the growing numbers of downloads and et cetera. Um, again, as always, I'm here to help. If you have any questions about the show or suggestions for the show or questions about investing, you can email me directly at brian, that's B-R-I-A-N, 
at investorinthefamily.com. Would love to hear from you and uh, help you in any way that can or direct you to someone who can help. All that being said, um, have a great week. And again, this is Brian, and uh, thanks for joining the family. The information and opinions contained on this podcast are for educational purposes only. The information does not consider the economic status or risk profile of any specific person. The information and opinions expressed should not be construed as investment trading advice and does not constitute an offer or an invitation to make an offer to buy and sell securities.